Beautiful. Thanks Let's again. see how this goes. Everything's running a little bit slow. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Ben Parslow from the South Australian Museum. Um, and before I get too excited, I just wanted to acknowledge I'm on uh, Ghana land um, and they are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so today, today I'm going to talk a little bit about some phylogenetic and phylogenomic um, data sets I've been working on to explore the parasitoid wasp family gastroptiidae. Slowly but surely. So for those playing along at home, I work on this really funky, strange looking group of parasitoid wasps. So uh, this is a family called Gastroptiidae. There's about 514 described species. Um, there's probably a whole lot more unknown diversity. Um, uh, there are about six genera and found all across the world. And they come in lots of fantastic different shapes and sizes. And there's lots of morphological variation in their kind of body shape and their ovipositor lengths. Now, something I find really weird about this group is historically they've been called carrot wasps. And this isn't because of that kind of elongated strange body shape. It's actually because outside of Australia, they're mainly found on carrot and parsley plants in the family um, Apaceae. But here in Australia, we mainly find them on um, eucalypts and um, plants in the Metaceae. So I thought a more appropriate common name is actually ghost wasps based on that kind of spectral eerie flight that you um, can see in the video, hopefully. Um, and this also kind of aligns a little bit more with their biology, which is one of my favorite parts about them. So these wasps are called predator ilquinines. Uh, and they uh, actually lay their eggs inside the nests of uh, solitary bees and wasps. So here's a little video of a female uh, using that ovipositor to drill into a masked bee nest. And then in the pane to the right, this is actually what it looks like. Um, so that's the ovipositor along the top, extruding the egg onto the wall of the cell. So once she's laid these eggs, they hatch into a larva that larva then consumes the host egg and then um, cleans out the pantry and eats all the provisions. Uh, once it's um, had its fill, it then pupates inside the cell before emerging as a, an adult and um, completing the cycle. So what we don't really know very much about is the host associations in this group. Uh, so part of my research was to actually uh, work out everything we did know and what we found out that there were um, five main bee families that they target, the Caledids, Apids, Megachylids, Helictids, and Stenotritids, as well as three main wasp families, the Cribronids, Sphecids, and Vespids. Um, what we also really found was that the wasp records were actually quite dubious. So a lot of them, we weren't really sure if they were actual real host associations or if it was simply a case of um, nest supersession with a wasp taking over a uh, cavity nesting bees um, nest. But we also um, run into a few other tricky um, problems when we start to look at the phylogenetics and the, um, the phylogenetics of the group. So this is a stylized phylogeny based on the only real phylogeny with any resolution done by Macedo in 2009 based on morphological characters. And as you can see up the top, we have the sister subfamily, the Hyptiogastrinae, with 89 species. Then within the Gastroptiini, we have four genera, the Spinolophoenus with one species, Trilobitophoenus with three species, and the Plutophoenus also with three species. And then the largest genus, Gastroption, with about 418 described species. So when we look at this in a little bit more detail, um, there's some really interesting biogeographical patterns. So the Hyptiogastrini in red are mainly restricted to Australasia with two species that are present over in South America. The three smaller genera are all restricted to the neotropics and often rarely collected. And then Gastroption is found 
absolutely everywhere all over the world. So this is really interesting to me. And uh, early works on the group um, say that Australia has the highest diversity with 114 described species, as well as the most specialized and diverse forms. So this has led authors to suggest that Australia may be the radiation center for the group, but we really don't have much information for that. So I wanted to try test this hypothesis. So we wanted to look at the internal relationships of the family in a little bit more detail, maybe map out the biogeography and also estimate the divergence times. So to do this, we generated a multi-locus data set using uh, three fragments, CO1, EF1 alpha and 28S. And as you can see from the colours, we have a really large um, inclusion of gastroptium, a small um, hippogastrinae, and our outgroups is orlacids and evaneids. Uh, black dots represent 100% posterior probability on this tree. So when we look at the biogeography, we start to get some really cool patterns. So in the um, basal parts of the tree, uh, we have uh, essentially an Australasian um, distribution through all of the hyptiogastrinae and all of the gastroptyon. So that's looking really good so far for um, an Australian radiation. But then we have this really cool pattern where we have two um, clades that are appearing. Um, and so our first clade up top in yellow is the clade that includes firstly, um, all of our Papua New Guinean species and their sister to a non-Australasian clade, which includes our only Indo-Malayan um, taxa, a selection of Palearctic and Afrotropical taxa. So potentially this could suggest that there was a dispersal event north um, around the Indian Pacific Rim. Uh, and in our second um, dispersal in orange here, we have our only two neotropical taxa that were included in this analysis. And this could potentially suggest uh, distribution along the Kerguelen um, Plateau. Maybe uh, this direction would be a little bit more difficult because crossing those ocean barriers will be actually quite difficult. But this analysis, we weren't able to include anything to do with um, Nearctic samples, and we had really underrepresented um, specimens from some of these regions. So we really can't be sure about these hypotheses, but it's starting to sound really cool. Uh, what we also found from that research is the divergence age for the group. So unfortunately, um, Gastroptidae has a distinct lack of fossils. Um, so what this means is we needed to source them from elsewhere. And luckily, um, a recent phylogeny done by Sharonowski and co-authors uh, had a really robust sampling of Evaneid um, fossils, which is this top clade up here. So we use secondary calibration points for three nodes in our tree and recovered some um, divergence ages, which were pretty congruent with a lot of the previous um, papers. Uh, one thing we also looked at is we summarized all of the known host crown ages that we could for um, host bees and wasps, and then tried to map them into this phylogeny. And what we found is that all of these hosts, uh, their crown ages were occurring in this uh, dotted box here, which is um, congruent with the kind of dispersal points for the family. So that was really interesting and quite, you know, exciting to want to explore that more. Uh, but unfortunately, this tree, we were still lacking some support at um, backbone components. So we wanted to uh, go a little bit further. So we started to develop our phylogenomic data set using ultra conserved elements. Uh, this was using the Hymenoptera version two bait set and a combination of four other loci, CO1, EF1 alpha, F1 and two and 28S. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors um, uh, on this part of the project uh, who've been helping out with analyses and contribution of specimens. So I was really excited because we were going to be sequencing more um, hyptiogastrinae from the neotropics and also from outside of Australia in the nearby parts, as well as material from the Nearctic and a large amount of material from the Indo-Malayan um, uh, biogeographic region. But unfortunately, due to this little thing called the global pandemic, um, some of our sequencing wasn't able to be completed. 
Uh, and so what I've done instead is kind of pull together the data that we had on hand to present a little bit of a preliminary maximum likelihood tree. Um, so this is our tree based on 137 taxa, about 1,200 loci. Um, it was generated using IQ tree and a sliding window site characteristic partition scheme. Uh, quickly, here we have the colors for our hippogastrini and our gastroption. And one of the really cool things I noticed with this tree is that our branch lengths are actually extremely short across this main gastroption clade. Um, I say that ignoring these uh, long branches that we have all over the place. Um, I think this is an artifact of missing data with some of these specimens and nearly all of those long branches conveniently uh, are all specimens that were in a single sequencing run. So I think something funny has gone on there. So I'll have to um, clean that data and check it a little bit more. But um, it's looking really interesting because this short branch length may be um, indicative of a rapid radiation for the group. Um, and that sounds pretty exciting because this isn't a really hyper diverse wasp group. Um, so we wouldn't really be expecting a, a big fast rapid radiation. If we look at the biogeography, we get um, other cool patterns. Again, we get those two um, clear, well-supported non-Australasian clades. And if we look at our Indo-Malayan taxa that we did sample, uh, they're coming out again um, with our Palearctic and Afrotropical. And interestingly, um, our Indonesian specimen here is actually grouping with a lot of the Papua New Guinean specimens. So it seems that our um, southern uh, India Malayan taxa are grouping closer to Australasia and our northern India Malayan taxa are up towards the Palearctic. So that's really interesting. Our two neotropical ones are also grouping with our Nearctic species as well. So there's obviously some sort of signal here. Um, I'm getting pretty excited and hopefully we can flesh out a few more of these regions to um, look into this a little bit further. Uh, so for future direction, I really need to continue um, checking this data, filtering it and making sure that those sequence mishaps aren't kind of causing any artificial signal. Uh, I'd really like to explore the Australian biogeography a little bit more because there's definitely some interesting patterns and also look at the host associations. Uh, I'd like to thank the following funding bodies for contributing to the project. And I'd also like to thank all of the collection managers and researchers for the donation of material. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, any questions? Uh, so we have a question for Lauren, just a quick one. Do you have any idea of the patterns of morphological diversity? Um, there has been a little bit of preliminary um, examination of how the different species map into the tree. And what we're finding is that there are um, clades that have very similar morphological characters. So I'm actually working on a little bit of a matrix at the moment to examine those relationships.